So it's now my pleasure to introduce our next panel. If I could ask the panel to come forward, please, and to introduce Jason Jay, who will be the chair of this panel. Jason is, the, is a senior lecturer in the Sloan School of Management, and as I said earlier, the director of the Sloan Sustainability Initiative. Jason. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, everybody. So uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm the director of the Sustainability Initiative at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, and what we do is we engage our students and alumni, our faculty and researchers, um, our allies in industry and government and NGOs as a community of innovators for sustainability. Um, and part of that work is a stream that we call Climate of Change, which is all about broadening and deepening engagement around climate change in order to drive innovation in this space. Um, and our collaboration with, with the Center for Collective Intelligence and the Climate CoLab is an integral part of that work. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to see how this whole community is developing and this, uh, this whole platform is developing. Um, what we're going to do with this panel is, as Tom mentioned, the theme of the conference is from ideas to action. And so each of the panels uh, in the conference is going to be organized around a sphere of action, um, the private sector, the public sector, communities. Um, and so this panel is about the role that businesses, the private sector, can play in tackling climate change issues. Um, now, my perspective on this issue comes from working with dozens of companies over the last five years as part of the S-Lab, or Laboratory for Sustainable Business, at the MIT Sloan School. And so we've seen a whole variety of corporate and private sector strategies on climate, environment, and broader um, social and environmental sustainability issues. Um, and what we've, you know, one sort of very simple way to think about what companies do, or what the private sector do, does, um, is in these buckets that we call how, what, and where. Um, so how is about how you do what you do, how you run your operations, how you run your supply chain, um, so that you're managing your own sort of impact in the world, your own carbon footprint, in a sense, in this context. Um, and what are the operational changes, what are the approaches to energy efficiency and other forms of resource efficiency that can help move towards a um, you know, more effective uh, use of those kinds of resources and a, and a lower carbon footprint for the enterprise. So that's sort of the how or the operational aspect. Um, the second is, what, is the what bucket. So what do you actually do as a company? What is your core business? What do you deliver as products or services? And how can you develop new categories of technology, new products, new services, new business models that actually go after the climate uh, issue, whether it's through renewable energy or energy efficiency technologies, things that enable others to move towards uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, and then the third bucket is what we call where or sustainable community. So how can companies reach outside the fence lines of their enterprise to collaborate with local governments and community organizations to advance sustainability at a bit larger scale than they could if they were just acting alone? Um, so what we have today is a fantastic panel that sort of represents this um, array of different kinds of engagements. Um, so what we're going to do is hear a little bit from each of them about the backdrop of the work that they do. Um, and then we'll have some discussion all together, take questions from the audience and from Twitter, um, and hopefully have uh, an enlightening discussion here. Um, the first uh, person I'm going to ask to speak is Victoria Mills. Um, she is the um, Pro managing director at the Environmental Defense Fund. And she's in charge of a program called the um, Climate Corps at EDF, which um, we've gotten to work together a bit over the years. Um, and they help companies work on energy efficiency and strategic energy management, including renewable and demand response technologies now. Um, so strategic energy management within the enterprise, so very much in that how bucket. Um, um, Matt Swibel is the uh, director of sustainability strategy for Lockheed Martin Corporation, has purview over both those kind of internal um, operational sustainability and carbon footprint kind of things, as well as thinking about what is the technology portfolio of Lockheed Martin and how could some of their technologies be used to create new products, new markets, new business models to tackle these issues. Um, <clears throat> and then Dennis Costello is the managing partner at Braemar Energy Ventures and has been very involved in launching those kinds of new products, new services, new technologies 
um, through the venture capital mechanism, um, and some of which, some of the companies that they've launched have a very strong community engagement uh, piece as well, which we'll hear about. So all of us are going to be able to speak to a bit of these issues, but um, we're going to have a, a bit of a, uh, uh, some you know, touch points on those three, those three aspects of private sector solutions to climate change. Um, so as I said, what I'd like to do is just invite my panelists to introduce themselves and say if, uh, a few moments of, of background about their work and their perspective on these things, and I'll ask you to start, Victoria. Thank you, Jason, and um, thanks everyone for being here this morning. I want to thank MIT for running this conference. It's timely and important, uh, and thanks to Jason for inviting me. Um, Jason and MIT Sloan have been terrific partners in our work through EDF Climate Corps for several years now, and we're uh, very grateful for that. Um, my organization, Environmental Defense Fund, is a national, now international, nonprofit environmental group. We've been around since 1967. And our four um, program goals are stabilizing the climate, restoring oceans, protecting ecosystems, and protecting human health. And um, we've also been known for a long time for um, market-driven solutions to environmental problems. Um, and we were among, we were one of the first environmental groups ever to partner with a corporation to drive an environmental solution that also made business sense. And that became the model uh, for 25 years of work partnering with business to achieve environmental results. So that's kind of the backdrop um, for how my program, EDF Climate Corps, got started. Um, and it was, it was about eight years ago, we were looking at the incredible energy savings that, um, and cost savings that Walmart was achieving through its energy efficiency efforts. And uh, wondering, you know, why aren't other companies all over this? It seems so simple, there's so much low-hanging fruit, and um, we, we had this hypothesis that something must be getting in the way, and, and that it, it would probably come down to organizational barriers like lack of bandwidth, lack of expertise, just not enough time, um, lack of access to money. Um, and, and that fundamentally those were not environmental problems or technology problems, but business problems. And so we thought, well, hmm, this is a business problem. Why not throw some bright young MBA students at it? So in the summer of 2008, we recruited and trained and placed seven graduate students, MBA students, between their first and second years in companies in California, companies like Intuit and Yahoo and Salesforce.com, Cisco Systems. And when those seven fellows found $35 million in energy savings in their organizations, we realized we had a powerful model um, that we could scale nationally and also extend into other sectors. So fast forward to this year, we had 117 fellows placed around the US and our first six fellows in China. Um, and we have worked with, with 300 unique organizations through this program, many over multiple years and 500 graduate students, including some wonderful ones from MIT Sloan, have, done, have been EDF Climate Core Fellows. Um, and we just had our, our, our annual convening last week, which Jason facilitated, which brought everybody back together again from this year and previous years, which was just a fantastic event, great cross-pollinization of ideas. Um, altogether, the program has identified almost a billion and a half dollars in energy savings and almost half a million metric tons of greenhouse gas reductions. Um, but I think even more than those numbers um, is the change um, that we're setting in motion within organizations uh, about looking at energy management as a strategic business imperative rather than a one-off investment that you do when you happen to have a little money left over. And I think that's really the change that we need to set in motion to achieve those larger goals of transforming our energy system in the United States and internationally, turning the corner on carbon emissions over the next five years, and ultimately stabilizing the climate. So that's my introduction. Great. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, MIT. And welcome to all of you around the world participating on the webcast. Um, my name is Matt Swibel, and uh, at Lockheed Martin, we define sustainability uh, more broadly than just in terms of the environment. Um, we're focused on six core issues, and two of which are extremely relevant to today's discussion, resource efficiency and our product performance. Uh, over the last three years, sustainability uh, has been elevated to the strategic imperative level 
Twice a year now, we report on our uh, performance and our set of metrics that we're monitoring and measuring against our targets directly to the CEO and to the board. And one of the reasons why uh, I think sustainability has gained a foothold of attention inside the company is because we're really at ground zero um, of understanding how to effectuate change uh, through innovation in sustainability. For those of you who aren't aware of what Lockheed Martin does, uh, we provide uh, more than 80% of our goods and services to the federal government across five different business segments. So just in the area of climate, our products uh, are used in outer space. Um, most of the government weather satellites are weather satellites that we manufactured or, and or support um, from, a, from an IT backbone perspective all the way down to making sure that uh, the installation of wind farms don't uh, jam radio frequencies. So our, our, our equipment is used for that as well. And sort of everything in between, almost at every different elevation, we're actually working on an infographic for our next sustainability report to, to help um, all of our stakeholders understand, you know, from Mars to uh, under the ocean, there's Lockheed Martin technology and innovation ultimately informing uh, stakeholders of how to make better decisions. So um, I, I, I think that today we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how and what at Lockheed Martin um, and, and what, what we see maybe uh, as opportunities. Uh, briefly, uh, in, in 2007, we did set a five-year uh, goal for energy waste and water reductions in absolute terms. We achieved that goal um, six months early, and so in uh, 2013, we set a new goal against a 2010 baseline going out to 2020. That's, um, that's, that's sort of difficult to do in a business where you're typically um, working against three to five year business planning cycles. Uh, but we are committed to reducing um, our energy consumption by another 25%. Um, and just to give you a sense of what that looks like, in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, where we manufacture the F-35 Joint Strike, Joint Strike Fighter, that plant is 8 million square feet um, altogether. Seven of million of the, that is air conditioned. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about what's required um, and what we've achieved thus far, our energy budget um, has been unchanged for over 20 years. We spend about $20 million um, to, on energy there. We're able to do that because of all the, in, all the efficiencies we've been able to realize um, over the last two decades, uh, small things and big things. And, and that's, that's what I'll leave you with. It's gonna take small steps and systemic efforts uh, in order to really uh, leave lasting impact. Thanks, Matt. Dennis? Thanks, um, and I'll join my welcome to everyone. Thank you uh, for, for being here and, and listening in or, or uh, being here virtually. Uh, my name's Dennis Costello. I'm with Braemar Energy Ventures. We're a venture capital fund, kind of the other end of the spectrum from, from Lockheed Martin. Uh, but we, we deal only in energy. Um, and we, we've been doing this for quite a while. And, and my, uh, my background has been uh, actually working in energy since, since the 70s. So, so it's been a long-term interest. Uh, <clears throat> what uh, what Braemar Energy Ventures does, which is, I think, in an essence, I mean, if you talk to our limited partners, our objective is only one, it, kind of unfortunately, which is make money. If we don't make money on our investments, then we're not around to make more investments. So, so uh, at one level, you know, it's a fairly si simple idea. At, at another level, I mean, what we're really trying to do, and the reason we focused on energy for so long, is that we think that with the help of, of, of capital, you can use capitalism to actually uh, may have an impact on, um, on climate and, and on the environment. And, 
And what we see by doing this for so many years, just to give you a little more background, we were the, uh, the lead investor in, in Enternock locally, which has been a huge success, one of the most successful companies publicly in that area. We've also been involved locally in, in uh, companies called Luminous Devices, a lot of LED companies. We were in A123, the battery company, which had uh, ups and downs. Uh, and, and also now more recently in Next Step Living, which is, we'll talk about that in, in a minute. But we have about 40 companies in a portfolio we manage about $600 million. Uh, we, about 65% of our investments are in energy efficiency of, of one form or another, which takes a lot of form. And, and the remainder is in both, uh, both fuel and electricity production, but also chemicals and related. So, so, so it's, um, it, it all de deals with technology. That's, that's the underlying theme. And the real job that we have and the real challenge is to get technology into wide scale acceptance. So, so we, our money goes to develop technology, obviously, in the early stage companies, but, but most of the effort and, and most of the hard work is to see how the technology actually really fits into the infrastructure of, of energy so that it can have a real impact. And, you know, there's a lot of scars because of that. There, there's been, uh, there's a lot of discussion, and I actually agree with it in some points, that venture capital is not really well positioned for energy because of its capital intensity. Uh, and, and because of how slow adoption takes and, and how, um, in how policy related or, or how policy influence the whole industry is. But you know, we've, we've managed to, to do okay in this area by basically picking our spots and, uh, and by trying to avoid those three major barriers and, and still make investments that, that, that look attractive to, to our limited partners. So, so lately, some of the things to give you a little bit of sense, you know, we've been heavily involved in lighting. The transformation to LED lighting is, is an amazing transformation uh, that I think is very appropriate for venture capital and has gone through all of the same dynamics of other semiconductor industries and the transformation from a, a traditional, you know, light bulb and, and a ballast into a solid state uh, uh, technology and therefore a solid state industry. Great opportunity for venture. We've done a lot in, uh, in, in biomass, both uh, the whole cycle of that, all the way from feedstocks to bioconversion. We're in a public company called Solazyme, which has done really well in that area. Uh, we've had our ups and downs in storage. We really think, as I think most people do, how important storage is, a difficult area. Uh, we've also been working on the energy impact uh, or, or energy use in computing, to put it broadly. And uh, th that has uh, yielded some interesting uh, investments that look a lot more like semiconductor. But and more recently, I think one of the really infer interesting things uh, it has, has been the use of information, which is really what, what Lockheed is working on, to, to make decisions more, more rationally, which is definitely in the realm of, of a venture, uh, venture kind of uh, capital raise. So, so with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, great. Um, so what I, you know, the theme of this, of this whole community and this whole conference is, you know, what are the ideas that could transform the world, right? Um, and one of the critical challenges in sourcing good ideas is asking good questions. And asking good questions is about knowing, you know, what are the really critical puzzles to solve? What are the nuts to crack? Um, so I just wonder if each of you guys just say a little bit about where have you seen, you know, what's the, what's the biggest puzzle that you confront that we really need fresh thinking to, to, to tackle and, and where, you know, some creative problem solving and bringing different kinds of minds together might be able to have an impact in this, in this sort of collective intelligence frame? Well, along the lines of asking the right questions, um, over the last 18 months, uh, we, in, in the process of setting longer term goals and understanding what are the core sustainability issues that we think we have a lever in. Uh, we, we took a look in the mirror, and when we did that, we looked at our entire life cycle, what we procure, how we operate, and what we deliver to our customers. And that process uh, illuminated the relative impact um, on a life cycle basis, and it shifted perceptions um, from uh, what goes on within our four walls to how our products are used, in many cases over 
two to three decades. Um, the C-130 cargo airlifter, I think, was developed in the 50s, mm. and it is still used today um, on a range of missions, most recently um, ferrying supplies for disaster relief efforts. Um, but what, what it does, what it did, it showed us that about 87% of our environmental footprint occurs during the product use phase. Um, a little less than 13% uh, occurs in our supply chain, so the, the materials that we procure, and only about 1% of it is from our operations. And so while um, there are a lot of good reasons to uh, continue to invest in operational efficiencies because it lowers your license to operate, it frankly delivers millions of dollars back to the CFO to reinvest in the business. It, um, it makes us competitive uh, from manufacturing um, practices perspective. Uh, and certainly, it's a unifying concept uh, from, from, a, from an employee and workforce um, pr productivity uh, perspective. But look, going forward, we're going to need to make some tougher decisions on um, how we early in the design phase engineer our products uh, so that they are as energy efficient as possible. So they incorporate in the manufacturing phase um, more additive manufacturing or composites, advanced materials that ultimately improve the environmental um, footprint during the product use phase. Uh, so how, how are we beginning to do that? Well, one of the ways where um, we, we would certainly welcome more thinking and more innovation around that is in the field of life cycle assessment and the government's use of it. Um, we uh, rely on the government's um, budget planning cycle which can change, and so when an acquisition is made, um, the chances of them doing version 1.2 or 2.0 uh, very shortly after is, is slim, right? So the more we know at the design engineering phase and the more um, robust, reliable, credible data and, and assumptions are embedded into life cycle assessments, um, that will better inform our engineering decisions and able to demonstrate the total system's value and the total footprint to our customers who increasingly are concerned about the resources required to use the products that we're delivering. Great. I want to build on your comment, which I really liked about um, taking small steps and big steps at the same time. Um, and I think uh, at EDF, we, we we're all about finding the ways that work. That's our motto. And we work on both market-driven solutions and voluntary corporate initiatives while also recognizing we need policy change. We need a price on carbon. Um, and we were just having this conversation um, with my team yesterday about asking the right questions and how asking the right questions at the beginning of an initiative can, can really open up pathways to progress that, um, that enable you to push something over the finish line or that, that give you new power to get stuff done that you didn't have before. And the example that comes to mind is around methane regulations. Um, and this is something that is being discussed and that we hope um, uh, the administration will introduce. Uh, and it's critical because CO2 is really important in a long-lived uh, climate pollutant, but methane is an incredibly powerful short-term climate pollutant. And if we can get methane emissions down, we can do a, it'll make a tremendous difference in turning the corner on carbon emissions. So, you know, more and more reports were coming out with the science of, yeah, you gotta limit methane leakage, you gotta eliminate methane leakage, especially with the burgeoning natural gas industry. Um, and, you know, we asked the question, we EDF asked the question, okay, the science is clear, we know all about the problem, what about the solutions? And we realized that there were two things on the critical path that we needed to do one is to, to, to get, help get policy done. One is to um, defeat the argument that the cost will be prohibitive. And so, 
And, and the other is another way to look at economic impact, which is on jobs. So we commissioned two studies, one with ICF that showed that the cost impact of methane regulations would be trivial when you consider the net gain of that captured methane. And the second one, which just came out with a company called Datu, looked at the growth of the methane detector industry, yeah. which, is, which, which is growing all over the country, concentrated in Texas and California um, and in the Southwest, has good paying jobs, good paying, non-outsourceable American jobs that pay anywhere from 20 to $60 an hour. And we showed the economic benefit of supporting this industry through methane regulation. So we hope that these will be two key pieces of the puzzle in getting the big change done that we need to get done. And um, you know, I think we'll see how it plays out. But I think you know, good strategy is common sense in retrospect. So, but I think if you can ask those questions in the beginning to open up what are the possibilities, that enables you to find the most important leverage points in solving a problem. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about the sort of you know the private sector solutions, I mean, I'm thinking about you know the investment that can happen in the methane detector technology, in the service delivery enterprises, and all of that can, that can happen. But what you illustrate is that a lot of times the markets for these technologies are created in policy. So the boundaries between sort of what's a public, what's a private sector action, and what's a broader, you know, coalition strategy is very fuzzy in this whole space. Yeah, and, and it's a chicken and egg, too, because the industries spring up in anticipation of the policy. And by bringing their voices to the policymakers, you can make it safe for those policymakers to vote in favor of something that supports them. Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I would kind of uh, take two ends of the spectrum in terms of ideas. The, the, the first is uh, to look at new kinds of business models where we're really rearranging the efficiency of the assets we have. I mean, you know, great, great current examples, I think, is Uber. Frankly, uh, an investment we, is not ours or, you know, have a bigger boat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but but I, I think that, that whole idea of taking a different look at how we organize our energy consumption or use can could yield some really interesting uh, new ways of, of energy efficiency. So, so I think that, and, and that's happening actually in finance. It's happening in downstream mm -hmm. solar, where uh, you know most of the investment and and a lot of the the U U.S. venture disasters in solar were upstream, uh, you know the the well publicized ones. But in in spite of that, the you know the the price of solar and photovoltaics in particular has dropped significantly. Continues to drop is having more and more penetration and has is creating all kinds of business opportunities downstream. Uh, you know, installation, uh, balance of system, and in particularly now in finance. And, and so there are some new business models being created in finance to make to to get over that initial cost barrier, which comes back to life cycle costing. Right? If you don't have to worry about it, and, and your your financing vehicle takes care of your life cycle cost analysis then you can make a decision based on first cost. So, so I think those are some ideas near term and kind of. So you think about like power purchase agreements, yield codes. Yep, all, okay. all that okay. stuff. Yeah, and, and I think that is that market is developing very rapidly and, and that is now gonna, I think that's gonna be a commodity very soon, which is terrific for, for the industry and for the climate, you know, for uh, trying to build a unique business out of that is, is probably more difficult, but, but you know, the, you know, it will happen. It is happening. So, so that's an exciting area. But, there, but there's another answer that, and 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 I, I think you know, in in a way, uh, the NGOs and Environmental Defense Fund is trying to do this. But what we really need is is a sustained recognition of the problem. That that I, you know, uh, on maybe going through too, too many cycles. Uh, you know, we are now in, from the venture perspective in energy. You know, this is a down cycle. Venture funds that, you know, had l large amounts of money for energy and venture funds that were more general were putting money into energy. That has really dried up, you know, and it partly is a, a, a result of the, uh, of the problems that were in, in, in storage, you know, in terms of business problems and, and, and in solar. So, so there's been a real retracting of, of capital, you know, private capital and venture capital in particular uh, from energy and, and those kind of sites, and I think it'll come back. You know, the, it, it will come back. You know, there'll be some success. We have Nest, we have Solar City. There's some really nice 
uh, Lumen Pulse. There's some nice IPOs that have happened. Uh, so that'll bring uh, money back. But that's a cycle that's like three to five years. And, and if we could avoid those cycles uh, from, from both a policy perspective and from a, from a capitalist perspective, by somehow bringing the awareness uh, of, the, of the population to, to a point where you, you, you can have some continued progress. Because, you know, I, I've, you know and I guess it's... Uh, one of the aspects of being older, but I, but I, I saw the solar uh, movement in the 70s and how you know it really took off. We, we were going to be at two dollars a watt in 1982, you know, we, for a system price. You know, we, we're kind of there now. It's a little delayed. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but if you know, if those kind of efforts could be sustained both at a policy level and and a corporate level, large corporation, you know, it would just help build that entrepreneurial community. I think that could have a bigger impact. So, I, I think that systems thinking, right, is is the holy grail because if you look at the adoption of renewable energy in the U.S. Um, I think that most people in this audience would say that's, that's a really good thing. It also presents um, serious risks and integration issues with our existing energy infrastructure. And so if, if we're going to ask the right questions, um, it, it, I think it helps to have more systems thinking. And, I, and it echoes the point you were making also, Victoria. Um, we've been talking also domestically. But what does it mean to have millions and millions of more uh, motor vehicles on the road as markets like China uh, and India develop? What does it mean for political leaders in um, uh, under-resourced countries to be able to say to their citizenry, we're going to get you power. We're going to introduce new access to um, electricity. Th those are... Uh, for a lot of good reasons, um, those are trends that will occur. The, the probability of those events happening are very high. So the question is, at a systems level, how do we ensure that um, we have the right uh, disruptive innovations, but also the right way of anticipating um, how systemically that will that will um, be properly integrated into the infrastructure we have today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's almost another <clears throat> angle on this predictive life cycle analysis challenge that you mentioned before, right? Is how, how in the early stages of development of a technology or a new approach do you think three steps ahead in the game and four steps wider in your mental model of what the impacts are going to be and then design for those, right? Um, so that, that sort of sustainability-informed innovation or climate-informed innovation process, which you know, we're working on here, but, but, is, but is something that this broader community can be, can be thinking about. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think this is a good moment to take some questions from the audience. Um, so uh, let's see, what I'd like you to do is, if you have a question, come line up at one of the two microphones here that are in the aisles, and then that way we can capture them for the online community and, uh, and record them uh, and, and make sure to all be able to hear them. And I'll, I'll alternate between sides. Um, so go ahead. Thank you all so much. Uh, this is a terrific start uh, to this conversation here. Um, my name is Andrea strimling Sampa. I'm with Deploy US. Uh, climate Initiative, and my question is for Mr. Costello. Uh, I'm really uh, captivated by your vision of sustained investment in energy and what it will take. And I am convinced based on data and based on my own sort of anecdotal evidence that there are many, many citizens who have money and who are worried about climate change or global warming uh, who are not engaged either on the policy side or the investment in energy and clean tech kind of writ large. So the question is, what are our opportunities to bring their energy, uh, their concern, and their money to the table uh, in a much more robust way, both as a means of financing the innovation in new technologies and business models, but also as an on-road to, uh, or an on-ramp to deeper civic engagement on the policy side? 
those questions, they, they, are, they are very difficult, but, but it's, it's very true. I mean, I, I think it actually starts in, 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 in their individual lives, and I think that's the way to start engagement. And uh, uh, it kind of brings, we were talking about this before, but we have a new investment, not, not, not to plug it, but called Next Step Living, which is trying to get res, doing residential audits, primary, first in Massachusetts, now in Connecticut and in New York. And, and they do the audits, and then they, they, they are become an advisor to help you decide is solar good, sh good for your house? Would, just, would just better windows work? Is insulation the answer? And uh, it, it's, a, it's amazing that you are with uh, households that, as you say, can afford this, are really interested in energy, but really don't know what to do. So, so I think business models uh, can be uh, cons con constructed, which actually, you know, activate that at, at, at so I think that's where it starts so just giving a little bit better information that's very specific to your life your lifestyle your home what, what your car whatever is is one answer and then I, I think the bigger answer is there are there is room and and I don't have a good construct for it but I think there was room for collective uh, of funding of, of energy in a different aspect. I mean, venture capital is very traditional. We go to institutions, we go to pension plans. They, they allocate 3% of their funds to alternative investments of that energy is one, of that, you know, venture is one. So, so you know, we've t and I think this has been uh, started and done a little bit with crowdsourcing. Uh, I think that the scale of that may be way, you know, too small, frankly, for the, the significance of the problems we have. But, but I think coming up with some new models to, to, for, for people to actually have a sustained real interest, economic interest in change would, would be great. But beyond that, I don't have anything yeah. specific. And, and we've seen you know, some interesting developments in the crowdfunding space, like with the jobs bill and you know, companies like WeFunder and others being brokerages for crowdfunding yeah. of startups. Yeah. But, yeah. but your sense is that, at the, and that's, that will grow over time, but your sense is that the scale of that total capital marketplace is still small relative to the, ener to the capital intensity of the ener energy yeah, I, I, yes. Yeah, I mean, by orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. probably. I mean, I think the venture industry, in, in its total, is, is a trivial amount of money right. to be spent on energy, frankly, right? Yeah. And, no, that, and that, that raises a whole other question about different pools of capital yeah. to support this. But um, let's, so thank you for, for a great so question. Much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's move over here. Hello. Uh, my name is Howard Hornfeld. I actually live in Switzerland, and I have to go back this afternoon, so I won't be able to stay for the rest of it. But I, before I ask my question, I'd like to scare everybody with a couple of little numbers. Uh, uh, Matt was talking about global rather than just domestic uh, factors. In the wor on the world scale, about 15% of the world's population has never used electricity in their lives. 15% of the world's population is one billion people. If one third of those people start to use electricity in the next 20 years, that's the population of the US as new consumers of electricity. That's a lot of people. That's factor number one. Factor number two, there is also about one billion people whom the United Nations says live in urban poverty around the world, Calcutta, places like that. When they start moving from being poor to lower middle class, the first things they're going to want are refrigerators, electric cookers, telephones, computers, and so forth. Air conditioners. Sorry? And air conditioners, especially if they're in hot climates. Yeah. Right. In any case, they will want electricity. So people in the urban poverty sector who are one billion people, if, again, one third of those in the next 20 years move from poverty to lower middle class, that's again, the population of the United States doubled as new consumers of electricity. And the third factor is the electric car, which takes a lot of electricity. Where are we going to get it? The answer is, and there is only one answer, and the answer is fusion energy. Now, I know that people say, oh, we'll have fusion energy in 20 years and always will, or something to that effect. That's no longer the case. We really can So make... I'm going to have to ask you to move towards a question. OK, the question really is to Matt. Uh, at Lockheed Martin, you have recently announced, through the Skunk Works uh, operations, a fusion device. It's not the first time. You did it about a year ago, and you did it again about two weeks ago. Can you tell us anything about that? 
The Skunk Works device so, is a yeah, fusion so, device. So this is this is great. So for, so for the further for the further questions, I'm going to ask for the ratio of question to commentary to be a little bit higher. But I, but setting this stage, setting this context is really important. So I'm glad we did it. But let's get to the fusion. Well, it was a very interesting experience. Um, I think I posted on my LinkedIn feed um, after there were, you know, any number of scientists uh, around the world who, uh, because they hadn't seen all the data and hadn't been in personally invited into the lab so that they understand the technology, which obviously we're not going to divulge, um, you know, in a public domain, it couldn't be possible, right? And so my, my uh, post to LinkedIn was, anything wrong with aiming high? Right, that's what skunk works. Um, that's what their DNA is. Unfortunately, I have to plead a little bit of ignorance, but it's genuine ignorance uh, in that I'm not an engineer. So I'm not going to be so bold as to come to MIT and describe to uh, this community the engineering principles behind our compact fusion um, lab experiment and development at this point. But I can tell you that um, the principles behind it uh, are in the public domain. Um, the, what we did is after um, we, uh, we had our initial pr uh, media coverage about it is we had our chief technology officer, Ray Johnson, and some of the engineers who are working on the um, compact fusion describe a little bit more of the principles that are behind it. Um, I think that they, they see the horizon as 10 years, right? So in a decade, is there something that can be demonstrated um, at, a, at a reasonable and meaningful um, level? I don't think that it is going to be a one-stop shop. I think that in order to address uh, the trends that you cite, we are going to need all hands on deck. We are going to need a diverse um, source of energy that is geographically relevant, that, it, that works for the community. Uh, and some of the trends uh, that we're seeing today, they might morph. So it, it may be more realistic from a life cycle perspective if we want to reduce GHG to have more community-based solar or industrial solar than to have um, ev the, the fabrication so that every single rooftop around the world has its own pa panel. I think that you're going to see um, disruption continue, um, but Lockheed Martin is just as invested in nuclear energy, um, which in the United States and in China is going to be a very big um, factor. Uh, we are not, you know, putting our eggs in one basket, so to speak, in compact fusion. Our, our friend Drew Jones at Climate Interactive often says that about the energy system, based on the modeling, computer modeling work we've done, is. There's no silver bullet. There's silver buckshot, um, to use a sort of you know hunting metaphor. I, I, it's worth noting that we, we have an investment in a fusion company too, by the way. So it's called General Fusion. So yes, uh, it's it's uh, it, it, we, we it can is tell you how difficult puzzle. that is. I mean, but. so I'll, I'll I'll put in a plug for something that, um, that's part of our our effort here at Sloan is um, we've contributed to a model called N Roads or E N dash R O A D S. Um, which has actually been used in one of the climate um, collab uh, contests, and essentially allows you to explore different energy mix scenarios under different policy assumptions. And one of the things you can do in the model is you can introduce new tech. And new tech is a technology that has you know, zero carbon footprint and is cheaper than coal. So it's sort of the hypothetical kind of thorium or fusion or whatever you want to think about. And the interesting thing about it is that it does not solve the problem, right? It still takes time to ramp up. It still has a development cycle. Um, it, 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 by lowering the cost of energy, it increases consumption slightly. So you have to deal with those rebound effects. Um, and so it's, a, it, it's an absolutely critical piece of the puzzle if you want to try to get emissions to where we need them. But it's very much a silver buckshot strategy that, that, that emerges out of that. Yeah, and along the way, we're going to have to come together as a community um, not just a community of businesses, but of government and NGO to evaluate what does it mean to bring online new energy sources. As an example, we are working um, with a Chinese real estate development company for um, ocean thermal energy conversion technology. And it's great, clean power. Um, the technology behind it is actually a few decades old by now. Um, 
one of the things that it does is it converts the um, temp temperature differential in ocean, uh, different depths, to convert it to electricity. Well, when you're sending, um, sending, in order to make it operational, you're going to need a certain amount of chemicals. Um, we want to make sure that we do things the right way so that when it's online, um, all of the informed stakeholders on the from the environmental um, footprint know what is the risk and what is the opportunity. Um, but if we only focus on the technology uh, and we don't take a holistic approach to understanding what it means to bring these online, I think we're going to have a lot of hiccups. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next question. Hi, uh, Brad Johnson with Hilke. I survived a master's in course 12 here, so uh, nice to be talking with smarter people. Uh, the, it was great that you talked about uh, where we need emissions to go. Uh, the new IPCC report uh, consolidated work that's already been done about how uh, if we're to stay below 1.5 2C warming, uh, the world needs to essentially phase out the use of fossil fuels by 2050, and certainly the developed world needs to do so. Um, and I'm just wondering what uh, your organization and your companies are doing uh, to try to achieve that goal? Or if you're not, um, frankly, why not? Well, we're on aren't it. We all, aren't we all here because yeah. we are? I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, every one of our companies is, is trying, trying to achieve that. But it just tells you how, how enormous the, the issues are we're facing. But, but in fairness, um, I don't think that companies are evenly transparent about what they're doing along the parameters that you, you described. You know, as on a sector basis, the aerospace and defense sector is actually doing more than its fair share um, to uh, emit at a level that um, would you know, be below global average temperature increase of two degrees. I think that informed, um, informed stakeholders see uh, less than a handful of industry sectors as, frankly, uh, yeah, yeah, mattering, being the lion's share, and, and maybe you can offer more on that. I mean, maybe you can talk about relative versus absolute goals a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I want to pan out a little bit first. I think, you know, even back to the earlier questions about what's going to drive innovation and investment in energy, and ultimately it's a price on carbon. And just can't get away from that worldwide. So, you know, we just got through doing our next five year strategic plan and looking at, given the scope of the problem and the urgency of solving it, what are, the, what are the leverage points? And it comes down to transforming the energy system in the US to enable integration of renewables, which we have a 100 year old energy system now. It's inflexible, it's all about putting out energy. It's not about this dynamic market of buyers and sellers that we need to bring about that can absorb renewables. So transforming the energy system in the US, shifting China to a clean energy system, looking at Europe, looking at deforestation in, in Brazil and Indonesia, those are really important things that we can do in the next five years that we absolutely must do, and then put in place the systems change that are going to get us the emission reductions we need between 2020 and 2050. So it can be done, but how is it going to get done? And this is where it's not just NGOs, it's NGOs and government and businesses coming together. And businesses' voices need to be much stronger in the policy conversation. You, you know, it's great if you're improving your energy efficiency, if you're setting absolute greenhouse gas reduction goals, that is what you need to be doing. The next frontier of leadership is engagement on policy. It's the chairman of Goldman Sachs saying we need methane regulation. It's companies leaving ALEC because it's inconsistent with their um, positions on sustainability, you can no longer be speaking out of two sides of your mouth as a company saying we do great things on sustainability and then lobbying against AB 32 in California. So um, I think that's what leadership looks like that we see in the private sector and how businesses can be really constructive um, in addressing the climate crisis. And, and I think it would, and, and even within the domain of sort of managing your operational footprint or even your life cycle footprint, um, one of the critical distinctions that we see is companies setting relative goals versus absolute goals. 
Um, and I think it's really incumbent on all of us to sort of hold companies responsible for setting absolute goals, meaning you know, you're going to reduce your absolute emissions by 20 50% because that's what the planet cares about. What a lot of companies will do is they'll say, oh, well, we'll have a relative goal because we're growing. We want to reduce our emissions per dollar of revenue or per um, you know, square foot of office space or retail space and so that we can keep growing our enterprise um, and being more efficient at doing that. But the planet doesn't care whether you build more stores. It cares about your to the aggregate total carbon emissions. And so we've seen within the EDF Climate Core Network sort of a move towards more absolute goals like the ones Lockheed has set um, as being part of really being serious about the problem and then confronting where, hey, this is not going to be possible unless we have a different set of incentives and a more meaningful price on carbon and the policy engagement that arises out of that. But science-based target setting is a major trend in the corporate world, I think, that we need to continue to support and propel and enable. Thank you. George Mokre, independent scholar from Central Square. First, a sentence about context. The uh, <clears throat> Lawrence Livermore National Lab does an energy budget every year, looks at the annual U.S. energy budget, and that's been flat basically for the last 15 years. So not to take anything away from Lockheed, but you're about average, mm -hmm. right? Um, we talk, I'm glad that you're talking about methane management, but are there companies who are actually going beyond that, talking about zero emissions the way that we talk about zero defects on a, on a, on a production line, zero emissions all the way through? I think I've not seen a lot of that. I think that's where the conversation needs to go, and it picks up on what you were saying about really looking honestly at what your footprint is. And um, there's a great model that WWF put out uh, called their carbon portfolio. I can't remember the name, but it, it starts with um, looking at your internal operations and your energy use, then looking at your energy sources, then looking at your whole supply chain and actually reinventing your products, um, and then finally policy engagement. Um, so I think you see companies uh, looking at kind of net zero water goals. You see companies like Walmart setting a 20 million metric ton greenhouse gas reduction goal. I think the zero, the, you know, going for that aggressive goal as one company needs to be balanced against what's the benefit of that and will the planet notice that versus your ability to play a constructive role in a systems change, like a price on carbon, that can make that um, get everybody on board. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's about the system boundary of the net zero, right? So you could have a net zero building, but people, would, or you could have a net zero enterprise, or you could be contributing to a net zero city or a net zero society if you could work on that policy stage. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I've seen whole companies, I mean, through carbon offsetting, I've definitely seen people say we're going to be carbon neutral um, and by essentially buying offsets for the um, emissions that they can't reduce. Um, but I would say that that's sort of fallen out of fashion in the last few years as people have said, hey, wait, if we can get, if we can save, you know, $35 million within our enterprise on energy efficiency, why would I pay for those offsets outside of my enterprise where I have less control of it and, um, you know, uh, may or may not be, be sort of you know well well governed and so on. So I feel like I've seen a trend more towards just kind of you know absolute reduction goals that are in the t you know twenty percent range um, within the companies that I've encountered. When um, I think it's Alcoa when they um, open a new mine, uh, they charge they they set a zero waste goal. So every single piece of equipment, every asset that goes into um, building the infrastructure for that, I believe that they have a commitment to, res to have a zero waste. And so companies like Bechtel um, have to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that that's one example that's related to what you're describing. Also DuPont, zero defect, zero injuries, yes. zero emissions. Whether yes. that's real or not is another question. But. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any, uh, I, I, are we supposed to be taking questions from the online community? We're good? Okay, good. Um, so, and are we okay on time to take one more? Great. Two more? Okay, great. So let's take one from over here. Peter Joseph from Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, we're in the U.S. carbon price contest, the little engine that could carbon fee and dividend. So incredible discussion, and there's a lot of systemic 
thinking represented on this stage. It seems to me that the problem, though, is the system in which you are functioning in which carbon pollution is essentially free, mm -hmm. right? Uh, carbon pricing has now been mentioned three times in this conversation, all by Victoria. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> so my question is, what is the best way to steeply ramp up the financial incentives for all of these companies to send the strongest possible price signal that is going to function in parallel to the other curves that we're seeing, like from the IPCC with temperature, greenhouse gas emissions, uh -huh. civilization has to respond in a parallel way. How do we ramp up those price signals uh, most advantageously considering the public's attitude and the current political environment? And our proposal, by the way, is to give all the money raised by carbon fee back to households so they can afford this fee. And I know there are other yes. proposals out there. So what is your opinion and how would your lives change, your work change, if you were functioning in an environment where there was a steadily rising, totally predictable, steep price signal on carbon. Thank you. I can My life would be tremendously better because all my investments would be looking a, a, a lot better. So, so you know, I, I definitely. You could finally you know, buy that yacht you wanted. It, runs it would on be your a bio sailboat, by the way, yeah. just, just to be clear. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. No, no, well, you've got biofuels in your portfolio. So. Yeah, well, we, yeah, just for the air conditioning. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that, that, I mean, I haven't said it, but, but obviously a, a, a price on carbon, I mean, it's, I'm an economist by training, so, so obviously there's a free good out there, and that is the ability to push carbon in the atmosphere, and that is, you know, I think most of us agree is, is at, at least one of the core issues here. Ways to get around that, I mean, it w would be interesting uh, that, that, that basically, you know, come off as that with offsets or with, whether it's a reduction in corporate income tax, which has been man mentioned, you know, along with, with a fee for, for carbon, it differentially Im impacts uh, di different sectors of, of, of industry. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, when, when I look back at, at the venture deals that I've done that have been a success, that we are focused really on energy efficiency in particular, the ones that have been the success have been those that there was some other feature, this is really unfortunate, other feature about the product or service they offered that went along with energy conservation or, or energy efficiency and uh, helped to pull the day. So, so look at LED. I mean, LED is a huge success uh, as an industry. But how did LED get started? It wasn't people saying, you know, I'm going to save 90% on my electricity for that light bulb, which is true, by the way. I mean, the energy efficiency is amazing. It was, oh, there's a reduction in maintenance. I don't have to go up on a ladder to change this. Or, uh, you know, it, it can produce produce different light, uh, uh, different parts of the spectrum. I can control the spectrum. It, I have better control. So, so it's those other features of the mm -hmm. characteristics of light that kind of have allowed us to get the energy, uh, con uh, the energy efficiency out of it. And, and I think that's unfortunate, but I, I think that happens o over and over mm -hmm. uh, well, again. And, 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 and so again, you go back to it, if there was a value put on, on carbon. Yes. Yes. That would be so much easier. And, and you're pointing to something that often gets, gets called co-benefits, right? Yeah. And, the, and the, the co-benefits exist at the technology level, right? As you said, LEDs being easier to maintain and you know, turning on right away as opposed to CFLs. Right. Um, uh, but there's also co-benefits of policies, right? So it's, so it's, you know, Beijing is losing people like crazy. There's a brain drain from Beijing because of air pollution. That is a selling point for a policy that's going to have those kinds of co-benefits. Um, and so I, th I think that that's, you know, as well as the, you know, how would a dividend in your pocket feel and how would a, you know, a boost to your investments feel, I think that's also a key part of the selling process and the engagement process around these things. So, yeah, we need a price on carbon. How do we get one? I don't know how to get one without policymakers. Who do policymakers listen to? They listen to their constituents. Who are their most powerful constituents? Major employers, entrepreneurs, corporations. 
This is about expanding your sphere of influence beyond your fence line. And I think um, you know, if, if it is in your interest as a clean tech entrepreneur, as a corporation that's making um, the, the most innovative technology that's out there at, at all levels of altitude and, and undersea, um, and really anybody who is participating in the economy to be thinking about ways that they can be talking to their elected representatives about the need for a price on carbon. And I think, you know, ultimately, we would like to see federal climate legislation in the next five years. I think, um, given the results of the midterm elections, um, it, it's going to be, we'll have our work cut out for us. Um, EDF is rigorously nonpartisan, but we are looking at, you know, the number of politicians who are hostile to climate action as opposed to open to it, and, you know, that's a reality we have to deal with. We deal with who's in power. Um, but I think it's, it's imperative to, to not just stop at your business, but to think bigger about what your business, what will make your business successful, and talk to the people who can bring those policies about that create the drivers mm -hmm. that enable your business to thrive. And that's true internationally, even more so than just the U.S., right, in terms of that. Matt, did you have something like that? Well, in terms of, you know, how to get there, I think that there's... I think there's an underappreciated um, willingness to, from from the private sector, to uh, look at the the topic within the context of corporate tax reform. Hmm. Um, and you know, one interesting fact is um, a, some, depending on how it's implemented, but you know, carbon tax can be an excise tax. And so, in, in, for, for example, in the aerospace and defense sector, an excise tax is something that is ultimately um, going to be a, a cost that could be passed through and borne by, by the federal government. So I think it's a question of um, less, uh, less rhetoric around um, that less rhetoric that divides and more thoughtful discussion on, okay, well, is, is, that, is, is there something we can pursue um, that's part of a bigger agenda? Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's an underappreciated willingness from the mm -hmm. private sector to, mm -hmm. to have that discussion. Could I Great. build on that just really quickly? If you look at companies, um, often it's hard for a corporation to come out and say, we want a price on carbon. That's political and scary. Um, if you look at companies who just came out with the corporate renewable energy buyer's principles, it was uh, convened by WWF and WRI, and you have companies like Sprint, um, other major corporations saying, we want to be able to buy more renewables. This is, these are the policy barriers that we're running into. We'd like to eliminate these barriers. That's incredibly powerful. It serves the same objective um, and is another constructive way to participate in the necessary transformation of the energy system. Um, it's not necessarily going to Capitol Hill and lobbying with your flag, but I'd love for you to do that too. But there are many ways to engage, Since like you your said. your organization has a global perspective, do you, do you actually see more of a likelihood of uh, something parallel to a carbon tax or a price on carbon? Um, occurring in another significant international market that actually might leapfrog um, the U.S. just because of entrenched positions and the persistent um, ur sense of urgency around pollution in places like China? We see it happening in China. I mean, there are carbon trading right. systems in regions in China. Um, because they're so big, they're, they're bigger than what's happening even in the U.S. I think the Global Warming Solutions Act in California, we're seeing that working really well, and we're hoping that that could be the model of what could happen in the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's a system in Europe that exists that we'd like to see expand and deepen. So I think the models are out there, but it's about bringing the success stories to the surface and sharing them. Let's take one last question. I'm going to ask you to be very brief in both the question and the responses so we can get it in here. The IPCC, which is unfortunately the lower common, common denominator of the science as a result of political pressure, has said that even if we were to reduce and eliminate emissions, we are still dealing with climate processes 
that are raging out of control. We don't even know if they are. Maybe we're seeing today what we put out 20 years ago. I don't see along the lines of the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. You were there when, when Gaylord Nelson said that, Dennis. I don't see any of that in your, in your equations. In terms of climate mom momentum and adaptation, or how? how climate you... momentum far exceeding the solutions that you're suggesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, and the urgency of it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our work is based on what it will take, what the science tells us is needed to stabilize the climate. We have those targets in mind. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's really scary, but we can't stop what we're doing. I mean, it's far too late for pessimism. I'm not, I'm so, not suggesting that, but what you're calling the science is very different from what you hear when you s sit down with a climate scientist who is not at the moment in the public eye yeah. and what they will tell you. Mm -hmm. This is not any, just an emissions problem. Yeah. It is far beyond that. And yeah. So, 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 uh, so, so, let's open, so let's open it up for just a minute um, to talk about sort of private sector responses that are more in the adaptation and possibly geoengineering spaces, which I think will address this, and, and then, we'll, then we'll wrap up. Well, I, I, there's, there's two responses. First, uh, I, I think that, it, that, that the fact that the problem is, is bigger than it's being realized really, really doesn't uh, negate the, the need to do what we can now within the resources we have. So I, doesn't, I don't think it has, a, has an impact in, in, in what we're already doing. Uh, but I, I do think we, we are and have to talk about at, at a, you know, adaptation to, to the change that is coming. So, so I, I fully agree with you. Uh, we are all kind of limited by you know, our, our own spheres of, of influence and our, our own business. But you know, as, as we keep saying over and over, I think energy is not a technology problem. It's a social problem. And, and that, that's what we, we have to deal with. And, and, and until there's a broad awareness beyond small communities that, that this problem is, is so massive, that could lead to, to the social change that, that it would really take you know, uh, to, to see the massive change that you would need. If, if um, what you're suggesting is that in addition to contemplating technologies that are focused on air emissions or um, energy-related solutions that we also need to prioritize climate resiliency um, opportunities, meaning we might not be able to chase the targets uh, soon enough. And so we've got to be able to be as prepared as we can to deal with the world we have. Um, I think you're spot on. Uh, our, think about um, the U.S. Navy or allied navies. Mm -hmm. What would rising seas do to their ports where their operations and their um, their sense of preparedness and security lay. So we're, we've, we fully understand um, that being resilient to climate change and temperature rise is equal, in, in our opinion, in terms of a priority, to creating um, s systems, system, ut utility-scale solutions um, to reduce uh, and, and, and um, address the, the, the rate of climate change. As they say, avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable, right? Um, so uh, I want to thank my panelists. Um, I, what came out of this was actually some very cool ideas for problems that our community could take on is maybe maybe potential contests for next year, which include you know, predictive, uh, predictive climate footprinting and life cycle analysis in the product design process, how to tackle that, uh, methane detection and how to build out a, an industry and, and policy um, mechanism around that, um, an approach to technology development that incorporates NGOs and governments from the beginning to address, these, to address the issues before they happen to avoid the next sort of uh, Cape Wind or whatever. Um, 
and uh, and then and then and then how to think about the um, advancing climate pr price on carbon and climate policies that are mindful of corporate interests, right? So so if we talked about fee and dividend, cap and dividend to to get the public on board, but what's the moral equivalent within the corporate sector to get the kind of corporate political action necessary to make something like this happen? So those are all, I think, really provocative ideas that have emerged out of this and that could be, that could frame further discussion and further ideas and further contests in the Climate Collab. So thank you very much for the contribution. Let me join me in thanking my panelists.